in May of last year, we, this bacteria breakthrough, if it weren't for, again, Ben Ranger and Harold Harrington of the local UA370, with Melissa Mays, Jill Robeson, all these mothers call me. We got this orange thing coming out of our sink, and we don't know what's in it. So oh, but I, that's normal, right? No, I'm no, sure. I made phone calls. Told. I know that's PhDs that, that mm -hmm. I do some work with and others, and, and, and some other people said, oh, that's standard, it's crystals, there's no bacteria. Oh, see, and, and, and to a large part, we are sitting here together. All I did is listen to mothers and plumbers. So I listened and said, you know what? I haven't thought about this bacteria. Why don't I send it to ALS and test it? Well, sure enough, this bacteria came back. So we started testing for bacteria. People will get to lead, but it's a lot more than lead in the water when of you course. get these compromised symptoms. Pseudomonas, we're finding in Flint and East Chicago, that is, that, that lives off iron. Mm -hmm. And we have control cities where we didn't find it. Traverse City, Michigan, Riverview, Florida, Brooklyn, New York. And there's another one called Sphingomonas, and that is copper related. So what we what we just discovered with sponge testing, that we can have a marker now with this bacteria that, su that may suggest that you have compromised pipes. It's all interrelated, whether it's, it's uh, uh, corrosion uh, related bacteria or biofilm or you know lead leaching, copper leaching, uh, any of the other heavy metals that leach out of the, the piping materials that we use. Um, you have to understand basic water chemistry. When it comes to the issue of, of bacteria in drinking water supplies, we have spent so long dumbing down water treatment technology. And rather than doing what we're supposed to do, which is take the dirt out of the water, we're putting in more and more chemical agents to sequester those reactions that's enabling or actually creating the biofilm to grow in a distribution system. PhDs and scientists are going to tell you most of these bacteria are harmless. They only like to eat iron out of the pipes. They only like to eat copper out of the pipes. And they're not going to, they're not going to harm you. They don't, they don't have a, a bacteriological effect on you. But let me tell you something about these bacteria and these biofilm. They don't like to party alone. <laughs> okay, they hang out with those guys called Legionella that killed about 35,000 people in North America last year in the United States, you know, and, and not in backwoods parts of the world. Here in Los Angeles, there was a huge outbreak in, in uh, the New York City water system last year. Flint has experienced mm -hmm. Legionella outbreaks. Everything's done on this quarterly negotiated schedule of concealing what the actual numbers are. Okay, so, so the, the toxicologists and the scientists at EPA put out a number and said, don't cross this threshold. Anything greater than this could present a health problem. Okay, and the industry, you know, basically negotiates that backwards, to where really what we're doing in this country is, is rather than saying what's in my water today, we're saying ah, uh, just take a quarterly sample and average it, and if you if you fail that, you have a chance to do a little extra homework and make it up with extra credit by cheating the sample, you know, three months from now because they only require quarterly sampling. And so there's all this gamesmanship that goes on out there. And what happens is, is the most common sequestering agent is they add ammonia to the drinking water supply. Okay, it, in a plumbing system that has cast iron pipes, iron's the meat and potatoes for those bacteria. You know, you talk about bacteria that like to eat iron. Okay, that's what they, they, they enjoy. You add ammonia to that mix, and it's like crack cocaine for them. They just absolutely freak out. They love that stuff and they get all excited and they grow and they multiply. And then we get into a situation where you get what they call nitrification because the bacteria are basically going out and, and growing in colonies and the chlorine attacks them and frees itself from the ammonia. So you get free ammonia in those pipes, okay? And that free ammonia is causing the microorganisms to grow. And no matter how much chlorine you put in that pipe, you can't get a free chlorine residual to occur. And so they call that nitrification and biofouling. Biofouling means you got so many bugs partying that you can't get the chlorine in there to kill them anymore. So you turn the ammonia off and you do a burnout and you turn the chlorine way up to go in there and burn out that little colony of bacteria that's overtaken your distribution system. Well, when you do that, what's happening is, and we've only been doing it in this country for the last 10 years, um, the misapplication of the chloramination process. And what's happening is, is, is the bacteria are going, damn, that stuff hurts, and they get, they get knocked around and a lot of them die. And then the second year, fewer of them die. And the third year, even fewer of them die. And now we're coming on our eighth, ninth, and tenth year of this practice of sequestering those reactions and feeding the bacteria in our water distribution systems. Now they've gotten smart. They've learned how to hide. 
they know how to survive. And what happens is, is, is like in, gene, in, in genetic selection, the bacteria are getting stronger and more aggressive. And we're creating super bacteria in the distribution systems of our drinking water throughout the United States because we're not cleaning the dirt out. We're actually making stronger bacteria that are getting smarter and more aggressive at getting around our disinfection systems. The Safe Drinking Water Act requires every drinking water utility in the United States to notify every one of its consumers on an annual basis. It's called an annual water quality report or a consumer confidence report. And it's supposed to be a tool that Congress has said you will give to your consumers to educate them. Well, I will tell you what has happened is they started doing them, you know, in about 2000 and um, then they, they Xerox it. And by the time the 2001 report came out, it was 2004. So the data was two, two and a half years old. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Well, you know what? I've still found, I still find today where they literally just take a pencil and change a few numbers in that annual water quality report and print them out on the Xerox machine and resend them out without doing any testing at all. And that's exactly how the lead and copper rule has failed us. The lead and copper rule is over 25 years old in this country. Why are we still screwing around with that goddamn thing? We should be on to more organic chemicals that were now introduced into the marketplace in the last 25 years that people are acting like, oh, you know, it's such a surprise. We were talking earlier about the 1,4-dioxane out at Long Island. Well, we've been treating 1,4-dioxane here in, the, in, in Los Angeles, California, for 26 years. We know what the chemical is. It's not a surprise. You know, why is it that it takes so long to get these people to just own up to what they need to do? You know, I'd like to see the Consumer Confidence Report talk to a family about how to change out the water filter in your refrigerator, how to flush your water heater. You know, some informative things that actually help the consumer because you're not cleaning up my water system. At least tell me how to mitigate my damages that you're causing me. Let, let, let me tell you, you something for your, Let me tell you something for your mothers around the country. When they go to a community meeting after the, the drinking water utility has created some sort of a violation, and there's a town hall meeting at city council, and the water utility manager stands up with a, with a, a, a jar of water and says, our water meets or exceeds all federal and state safe drinking water act requirements, which is the canned speech they are all taught, you know, when they begin their careers. Um, if they begin with that, you immediately know that they're about to tell you a bunch of lies. So what they need to do is they need to come to you with what happened, how it happened, how they fixed it, and what you can do to mitigate those damages. Because, you know, telling me that there was a bacteriological outbreak 90 days after it occurred, or telling me 90 days after um, you violated trihalomethanes, frankly, that's bullshit. You know, it's not doing any of us any good. You know, something as, as simple as in Flint, Michigan, have, have they told those mothers, um, throw out your teapot? You got a tea kettle on there? And, and how many of us literally go and pour all the water out before we refill our tea kettle? No, you pour tea, you make some soup, you use something with hot water, you refill it. Cut open a teapot and I'll defy you not to find extremely high concentrations of lead because they just boil the water out and they accumulate the inorganics. And that's a problem. Something as simple as, hey, we got a lead problem in our town. Drain your water heater. Check your filters in places you don't know you have filters. If your kids are on humidifiers because they have upper respiratory issues, change them, throw them out, start over. If you have a tea kettle, get rid of it. Get a new one. Ask your mothers how many appliances in their homes use water. And then, do they have filters? How old are those filters? When were those filters changed? I mean, it, it, it goes on and on. People don't realize in their laundry machines, in their dishwashers, garbage disposals. I mean, it's just everything that uses water in your house needs to be checked, cleaned, maintained. They don't even have the common courtesy to share that with the, the consumer. Was what I was blown away with in Flint is that when, it, when, when Harold Harrington, again, the, the local UA370 business manager, an affected homeowner resident of Flint, I was back in February, he had pamphlets dropped off saying it's safe to shower and bathe as they took cold water without testing. And when I said, how can anybody, given what's going on, how can the government be declaring and the state agencies declaring it's safe to shower and bathe without even testing the shower water? I got like attacked before I've never, I, and we started, that's how we started testing the actual hot shower water. I mean, is it, isn't that mind boggling? No one wants to talk about skin contact or breathing. Right, uh, you know, it's, it's the, back to that quarterly sampling you know, charade that they've pulled off on the American population. Um, if you experience trihalomethanes, that group of disinfection byproducts 
associated with chlorine mixing with dirt that you've left in your water supply, the most prominent one being the chloroform that you're finding. Trihalomethanes may cause a 65-year-old white working male 1 in 10,000 increased chance of bladder cancer. They're most dangerous to pregnant women. There is there's health of study after health study after health study that talk about exposure to trihalomethanes in first trimester causes spontaneous miscarriage and in the second and third trimester low birth weight. What's a trimester of pregnancy? 90 days. It's right in between that quarter of sampling requirements. Okay? There's a problem with that. Do you know all drinking water standards in this country are based on physical consumption? Okay? Do you know that a pregnant woman can inhale in a five minute shower more than she could drink in 90 days? The EPA put it, Susan Richardson put it, Dr. Susan Richardson with a PhD from the EPA, so then it's got to be right, right? <laughs> she put out that study Please in, don't in get me started. It, 10 minutes in a shower is equivalent to drinking like two liters of contaminated because of the air when it air so the, they had this information in 2009 right and and yeah had this kind of information back when i began my work in 1991 they just don't want us to know but scott you're talking about parts per billion do you know that's a grain oh, of sand in the superdome or a grain of sand in the rose bowl i love the i love the analogies of the pictures that they paint for you you know do you know that a milligram per liter of chlorine, just one milligram, and they're feeding three, four, five. We've seen systems with nine milligrams per liter of chlorine in it, okay? And that's the, the one part per million, one part per billion. PFOA is being measured in parts per trillion, but you wanna know why? Because parts per trillion and PFOA, the federal health advisory is 70 parts per trillion. That sounds ridiculously low, okay? New Jersey and New York just dropped it to 40 last week because they're really concerned. 90% mm -hmm. of the toxicologists out there will tell you it shouldn't be it at all, zero. It's a bioaccumulator, which means if I drink one today and I drink one tomorrow, now I got two. I drink one the next day, now I got three. By the end of the week, I got a couple parts per billion, parts per million, you start accumulating this nine and a half year half-life in our body tissue. It's one of the few chemicals known to man that actually does do that. Okay, and I started explaining this to a toxicologist and I said, the way I understand it, doctor, is one plus one plus one is three. And he says, oh no, Bob, you're wrong. In toxicology with this particular chemical, one plus one plus one is five. At the end of the day, when you explain to a mother that she's feeding this to her child, game over. Unfortunately, it's, it's somewhat becoming a social justice issue. You know, Aaron mentioned Hannibal, Missouri. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a middle class community. That community is really concerned about the cost of actually cleaning their water up. And it's because the water um, uh, industrial complex has basically convinced them that to clean the water properly is going to cost you millions of dollars. But then you go to a, a more upper class community, Charlottesville, Virginia, hometown of the University of Virginia. And we went and spoke there about four and a half years ago and the community listened. There was an open and lively debate at city council. I was against the addition of ammonia to the drinking water system, and the city council put it to referendum or vote in the community. And the headline in the newspaper in Charlottesville, Virginia said, a community as sophisticated as Charlottesville has no place for chloramination. So they were willing, because they could afford it, to say clean my water properly. Well, not all communities can or think they can't afford to clean their water properly. And frankly, I have a problem living in a country where if you're poor, you deserve dirty water. And if you're rich, you can afford to clean it up. That's bullshit. And that's what's occurring in this country. And, and frankly, the sad and pathetic part of that is that the consulting engineering firms and the water utility managers are actually convincing the community, it's okay, you can't afford to have us clean the water properly. So we're gonna add ammonia because it's cheap, easy, and quick, and you won't even notice. Everything will be okay. The regulatory industrial complex, I mean, it's, it's literally, you know what kills me? Is in this country, everybody's like, oh no, they're gonna shut down the EPA, they're gonna shut down the EPA. There's no way in hell they're gonna shut down the EPA. The EPA does not exist to protect the environment. Do you wanna know why the EPA exists? It exists so that all the corporations that already have the permits have barriers to entry so you can't enter the marketplace. So they're not gonna get rid of the EPA. It's, it's embarrassing that the water utility industry actually has a group of people that negotiate 
regulatory compliance. What the hell does that mean? There is either shit in my water or there is not shit in my water. Stop negotiating a 90-day long-term running annual average compliance schedule for something that can harm me in one five-minute shower. That's ridiculous. I've got another one for you. Recently, I had a PhD tell me that it's bullshit about phosphates being candy for bacteria. Phosphate is a, an element, and it comes in thousands of forms. And what you introduce into a water system morphs into other forms chemically after its introduction. The element can be converted into the consumptive bacteriological candy that we're referring to. Phosphate's a nutrient, okay? And, and, and bacteria and living organisms love to consume it. Nitrogen, ammonia, urine, it's all nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite, all the different nitrogen compounds. It's ammonia, NH3N, you know, we can get real sophisticated. It's, it's pee, okay? It's a nutrient, it's in fertilizer, it's a nutrient. When it enters the drinking water matrix, it breaks down into various forms of nitrogen, but at the end of the day, it's food for bacteria. March 7th, uh, 2016, I'm holding a galvanized pipe with the plumbers in the room with Mark Ruffalo next to me raising the issue about galvanized pipes. And Bob, I want to get your thoughts about the lead. You know, the galvanized pipes now are going to continue to be a problem, and that's been confirmed now by PhD research. It's not the metallurgy or the metal components that make up a plumbing system. It's the water quality, Scott. It's the water quality, Scott. It's the water quality, Scott. Until you get your water quality understood and chemically balanced and, and introduced into a treatment process that is, is compatible with a distribution system, you know, until the last 10 years, the distribution system and the treatment plant didn't even communicate, okay? The distribution system is perhaps the most important component after the water quality is introduced into it. And until you understand how the two work together, it's the water quality. You know, they could take all the lead out of, of Flint tomorrow, and as long as they leave the brass fixtures in, yes, brass, brass water meter. Do you know that, that faucet that has the nice chrome plating on it? that sits on top of the, the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink, underneath it is brass. Do you know brass is 17% lead? Now they've re-regulated and said that we have to have lead-free brass in this country. Industry went kicking and screaming saying you can't cast bronze or you can't cast brass without a certain you know, percentage of lead in it. So don't talk to me about galvanized pipe. Don't talk to me about steel pipe. Don't talk to me about iron pipe or copper pipe. Every kind of bacteria out there has its own favorite kind of metal it likes to eat. That's a great point. We need to really educate people even more on that. And the plumbers. So, And they are. They're stepping up. They are becoming educated. Premises plumbing is, is the new frontier in this industry. And the plumbers are going to pay an important role in that. And so as much as we need to educate the mothers, we need those plumbers to, to sharpen their pencils as well. That's what we're doing. So we're starting a national program. I'm already underway with the plumbers. We're going into, we're starting with 10 cities and we're going to expand it from there. Yeah. And we're starting to acquire data that doesn't exist. From the toxicologists, there's bacteria we're finding that no one knows the human health effects. There are hundreds of different types of iron eating bacteria. There are hundreds of different types of, of bacteria found in distribution systems. Most biofilm are actually uh, a good to have in certain components of water treatment. We treat our wastewater with bacteriological colonies. So, so we shouldn't be afraid of bacteria, but we need to identify the ones that will make us sick, that will kill us. And what happens is, is those are the little bastards that hang out with the good guys, okay? And that's why I was saying, you know, biofilm can throw a hell of a party, but when you add E. coli and Legionella and brain-eating amoeba and all these things that can kill our kids into that mix, we got a no, problem. Brain-eating brain amoeba, that's, that's some scary shit. Non-tuberculosis microbacterium is some scary-ass shit, too. And it is a Jeez. problem that we have yet to discuss. But listen, that's you know, we talk, and, and it is, <laughs> we don't want to fear monger. But you know, on the other side, you shouldn't suppress either. And I think that the information needs to come out. People need to be educated on it so they're more informed and more aware, and they'll make better choices. 
for the health and the welfare of their own family and not leave it up to somebody else to do it. Chemicals and bacteria, uh, how much is regulated and how much is not? How, how much do we really know? In the regulatory community, we have action levels and we have health advisories and we have public health goals and we have maximum contaminant level goals. The only thing that actually rises to the level of a regulation is a maximum contaminant level. It's the only legal in, legally enforceable regulation in the Safe Drinking Water Act. Everything else is just public information and health advisory. Okay, they can require you to take certain action, but frankly you're not in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act if you have violated that, that level that's set up into a maximum contaminant level. Okay, there's all this national hullabaloo about lead. Do you know what the maximum contaminant level is for lead in drinking water? Trick question! Don't go there! There isn't one. There isn't one. It's a trick question. Yeah. It's these. It's 15 parts per billion. Is the action when you take action? Is that correct? Well, it's yeah. it's basically the whole concept of the lead and copper rule is is based on an action level, and so even if you have a few homes in town that are 5,000 parts per billion, and the and the measurable action level is 15 parts per billion, you're still not in violation of the law because you have to have have a, you meet a 90th percentile, meaning if you sample 100 homes, nine of them can come back higher than 15 and everything's okay. Unless you happen to be one of those nine homes, you're screwed. So we have 88,000 chemicals out in the marketplace. How many have MCLs established, maximum contaminant levels? In the Safe Drinking Water Act, less than 200. Do you know there's not a maximum contaminant level for Chrome 6? the Hinkley contaminant that Aaron's famous for? Well, California set one, even though we've had some setbacks. We do have a... Right, but there's not a national drinking water standard not for federal. hexavalent chromium. No. Yeah, yeah. Lisa Jackson promised us one six years ago. We didn't get it, and I don't think we're ever going to see it. We're never going to see things it. they don't want to do. Yeah. They just don't want it to happen. You know what? They just don't want us to know. So, um, on the same line of questioning, you know, um, Legionella has a maximum contaminant level. How many drinking water systems test for Legionella? Another trick question. Probably none. Yeah, they test for, for an indicator organism, okay? Coliform, coliform bacteria. I just put some coliform on you. It exists everywhere in the environment, okay? So they use it as an indicator organism. And what, what that means is, is when they go out and they find coliform in the water, then <clears throat> the others might be there. So you have to take a follow-up test. And when you take that follow-up test, they say, we found it at this location. And the reg says, you have to go upstream and take a sample, and downstream take a sample. And because you found coliform in the water, you have to test for E. coli. Okay, so you go here and here and test for E. coli, and here. And then if you have a positive sample, the boil water notice kicks in, the notification program kicks in, and everything like that. Never do they test for Legionella, Crypto, Giardia. I mean, you remember how many people were killed in Milwaukee here about 10 years ago with the, the Cryptosporidium outbreak? I mean, deaths. Well, the non-tuberculous microbacterium, what they're looking for hundreds of thousands. They're looking for hundreds of thousands of people that inhaled this <clears throat> in a hospital appliance. And the bacteria are, are morphing and mutating. Um, Legionella, you know, I hate to beat the, the dead horse that is that bacteria, but it's, it's uh, you know, scientists are actually calling it the greatest crisis in, in North America's drinking water supply right now. A university discovered uh, a new strain of Legionella just this last year. They always used to tell us Legionella was only found in hot water sources. It's associated with cooling towers, it's associated with underheated hot water. You find it in decorative fountains and spas. You know where they found it last year? That mutating little bastard? In a hospital ice machine. How many people in the drinking water community know Legionella now exists in hospital ice machines? Nobody. They didn't tell anybody. It's out there. And it's mutated. Now it likes cold water. One of the things you get beat up on a lot is fear mongering. You're just out there trying to, you know, whip up business and scare the shit out of people. And, and that's not a fair description of what you're doing. At the end of the day, it's about providing people information. And frankly, okay. you're providing people information because they're not. All yeah. you're doing is filling the void that they should be um, actually doing in the first place. And that's just providing information. We're not out there trying to whip up anything or cause anyone any fear. Be not afraid. Oh well, yeah. Gain knowledge. That's awesome what you're doing. So get the Wizard of Oz. You're just <laughs> pulling back the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone gets to see. 
Oh, you guys aren't so tough in there after all. Well, I found these, when you go into people's homes that may be having health issues from water, I've found that when you talk to them about the results, instead of them being told it's okay and you're giving, the, there's a sense of relief and they're, the mothers are pretty vocal. Well, thank you. You know, at least we know we have information. Absolutely. That gives them a sense that when they have information, they can then go seek out medical experts and do whatever they want mm -hmm. with that information, which is their absolute right. And they, have a, they now have a choice. And being able to make a better choice based on information, whether you see it as the truth or not, gives them the chance for a healthier life. We shouldn't be taking that from anybody. This should be fully transparent and available to them at all times. Providing a detailed independent test report to mothers, fear mongering. It's, you know, and then, and then the thing is, and then the media, I've even had some media out of Flint say, you know, you're, you're giving out this information and people, people aren't smart enough to understand it. And uh, we get threatening calls from the PR people at the governor's office that if we cover any of this, we won't have access to the governor anymore. Is this the same governor that hid this whole thing from day one anyway? Like, I believe any bullshit that comes out of that office. I don't think anybody in Flint does either. I think they're on their own path and it's one that they should stay on. It's really sad, you know. Hinkley taught us that chromium-6 can end up on our water and Flint taught us that, wow, our agencies and our governmental agencies, the very ones hiding things behind us that we believed were actually there to protect us, that's a tough blow. Some of this money in Flint, though, I found out this is a fact that ex-AP bureau chief actually left the Associated Press and became the lead public relations person for the state and is sending all this out to the media. So maybe we don't, we were talking about we don't know where the money's gone in Flint. Maybe it's gone to all the PR people. Well, I know that, that somebody will take a slice every step along the way for themselves. And, and you know, frankly, it needs to go straight into infrastructure, you know, repair and replacement, period. Um, but just removing all the service laterals that contain lead is not the answer. You know, that distribution system in Flint still has not been properly addressed. No. Um, you know, the, the hydraulic flow model that I mentioned back in, in February 2015, still not in place. Uh, I'm going to make a prediction right here, right now. I'll tell you what's going to happen, okay? You've already started to see it where they say, well, our responsibility ends at the meter, okay? And so you're going to go out and you're going to show consumers and homeowners actually how to start. That's why we're testing with the plumbers at yeah, the yeah, meter. And you're going to start testing and everything like that. Get ready. The utility industry is going to turn back on you and say, oh, it's the way you improperly designed your plumbing systems. You created dead ends. You use dissimilar metals in the wrong uh, uh, sequence. All these different things, they're going to start turning it on you and, and frankly, it's gonna turn from, we give you crappy water quality to your poorly designed plumbing systems, what's at fault, okay? You know, wh what do you mean you didn't, you didn't uh, provide the consumer with the, the appropriate instructions on how to flush their hot water heater? You installed it, I didn't. What do you mean um, you went from, from one inch pipe to three quarter inch pipe to quarter inch pipe at the other end of the house and it dead ends and that's where all the bacteria grows and then when you turn on a shower or flush a toilet at the other end of the house that bacteria backflows into your water sample this isn't their fault this is your fault that's where we're headed